of these I want to do one more. The Soviets. Here we go. Okay. So the Soviets, right? Now I'm doing this because I'm giving you a, a window into one of my many lives when I was alive during the Cold War, and all everyone could talk about is how massive the Soviet threat was. That the Soviets were going to take over everything and destroy the world. They have all these weapons and all these men, and we're doomed. Partridge, your uh, screen is sharing your um, A push imperialism recording. And you have a problem with that? A little bit. Why? Yeah, why? <laughs> I, I, I give and I give and I give. That's really rude of you, Marin. I know. I'm a horrible person. How about this now? That works. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So these are the kind of diagrams I would see growing up. And remember, you have the Soviet military alliance, which is called the Warsaw Pact. And the, uh, the American military alliance, what's called, because it still exists today, what is it called? NATO. NATO. And it was all these, it would be constant in the 1970s, especially after the Vietnam War, and the humiliation of losing that war. That the U.S. is falling behind, that the Soviets are about ready to attack, they're building all these weapons, they're amassing this huge military force. I mean, this was drummed into everything. And that we can no longer have peace. We must start building up weapons. There could be no agreement. This is going to lead to the largest peacetime military buildup in American history. All because of the Soviet threat. So they show this, these pictures up. The red, of course, it was always red and blue. Red, blue, always red and blue. And so they would have this huge number of tanks. Like this is the one of, of main battle tanks where NATO only had 17,000 and the Soviets had 46,223 tanks. It's like, we're doomed. And there's these visions of Soviet tanks crossing over into West Germany all the way to the Pacific, all the way to the Pacific, that'd be heck of a drive, and to the Atlantic. And this is going to lead to paranoia. This is going to lead to a conservative revolution. This is going to end Keynesian economics in the United States. This is going to have huge ramifications. Now you can say that's a good thing or a bad thing, but wow, what a shift is going to come out of this. I mean, in 1980, in the presidential election between President Jimmy Carter and Governor Ronald Reagan, this was Reagan's issue. That the Republicans have allowed it, or the Democrats have allowed the Soviets to catch up, and we have a window of vulnerability. And President Carter then said, oh, build up weapons too. And that's all everyone can talk about, building weapons. Yes. There's a little bit of that. There's always a story about the Russian steamroller. Yeah. But the biggest thing was, and, it, and I mentioned this before, you know, they beat the Germans. So they must have some secret sauce. You know, like, oh, and I should add, um, we know they're going to use nuclear weapons. They have no fear of death. But don't forget, we're the country that used them. And don't forget that. We're the one that did it. And then, no, oh, they're so evil, they'll use nuclear weapons. Well, like, what we did. And Japan was already defeated. But that's another story. That's another myth. And so we had all these stories of this. And this was a graph. I, I got this from a Newsweek. And it showed a huge increase in Soviet spending. And CIA, the CIA said, look at this. They are overwhelming us. And there's another one of these. They've got all the divisions and manpower. I mean, it's just they're going to kill us all. And so when President Reagan was elected, we, did, we began a 10% increase in military spending for the first four years. 10% in 81, 10% on top of that, 10% on top of that. So a net almost double of military spending by the end of Reagan's term. Were the Soviets that big of a threat? Not even close. How about the bears? Huh? How about the bears? That's a valid point. They did have bears. Yeah. Yeah, and that, but the bears, let's be honest, bears hold no allegiance. That's true. Yeah. But what if all the bears? Yeah, only bears are selfish. So here's a cartoon, though, and this was done at the end of the Cold War. 
and it's showing the reality. It looked like a fearful giant army, and yet look at the decrepit system behind it. The Soviet system was literally falling apart, absolutely falling apart. They began a massive military buildup after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it broke their economy. They were building weapons and missiles as fast as they could. They were barely holding on. Yeah. Get it. Well, our economy is radically different after that. We used to have a massive trade surplus, now we have a trade deficit. Most um, we are completely dependent upon imports for most important manufacturing products. The biggie that has now become a catastrophe is, for example, uh, microchips, but it went back for steel, it went back for almost everything. I mean, look at your masks. Where are they made? A few cloth ones, but they're all, especially the, you know, the, 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 the high quality ones. <laughs> Actually, if I did, I finally decided I better get into it. But it's great. We don't make anything. And something else had happened. Since this huge arms bill can justify it, what happened to the inequality of wealth? So we can say that's a good thing or bad thing, but it did certainly totally wreck the old US economy. It is not the economy I grew up with is completely different than the economy you grew up with. What do you mean by real wealth? Good point. One of my many lives. Well, I just wrote. Huh? We, we, we just have rocks. <laughs> and whoever had the biggest rock won. Right. But. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's significantly different. So you make a valid point, you pay for it. And it's a radical shift. And this is actually kind of a national security issue. Because if we do go to war, let's say we go to war with, let me throw a country out of it, China. And I don't want that to happen, but let's say it does. We have no arms manufacturing. Because almost all the raw materials, the components for all of our for our weapons, huge parts of it come from China. It wasn't like that. And which is actually scary. Really scary. And gee, as it becomes more complex, you don't think they put like bugs or something in some of They would never do that. Okay, moving on. Oh, sleep well enough. And so the Soviet army was an absolute paper tiger. You know, there's all these pictures of their incredible weapons. Their missiles were huge, and they made a big deal out of these mobile missiles. Part of the reason they were so big and they carried up to a 50 megaton nuclear weapon on some of these missiles, that's a Satan missile. S-A-T-A-N, Satan. I don't think they pronounce it that way in Russia, but I look at it as Satan. They couldn't, they're really inaccurate. So the weapons, have, the, the warheads had to be big because they're so inaccurate. This means big. Their helicopters, they're fearsome, loaded with weapons. Well, when they used them, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan through the 80s, the realization hit that they couldn't maneuver. They'd be shot down like that once they figured it out. Just totally worthless. And their tanks. Well, first off, you saw that number where they had three times as many tanks. Well, because the Soviets never threw anything away. They were still using tanks that were made in World War II. They put them on their numbers and kept them in reserve, these tanks in World War II, which yeah, are probably not going to use in a modern war. They just really care about the environment. What's that? They just really care about the environment. No, no they're... <laughs> not the Soviets. <laughs> and they're still making these other tanks. And this was a fearsome tank called the T-72. And this was the tank that said, it's the most awesome tank in the world. No way American tanks could stand up to it. Yet, when American-made tanks fought Soviet-made tanks in Lebanon, Israel invaded Lebanon in 82 and 84. And they used American tanks against Syrian tanks with T-72s. Anybody want to guess what happened? These things were just destroyed, just destroyed. And in 1990, the same thing would happen in the Gulf War, when the United States and, its, and some allies would push Iraq out of Kuwait. 
they were using these Soviet tanks, and American tanks just destroyed. American and British and French tanks just destroyed. Not even close. Not. It, it was, it was forty to one. Forty Soviet tanks, Soviet-made tanks for every one American tank destroyed. But we built this massive increase in defense spending because of it. In fact, Reagan called it the window of vulnerability. As I said, this led to the Soviet Revolution. And this is actually a really big, here is the massive increase in American defense spending. The Soviets, they increased the amount they spent, but ended up spending nearly 50% of their economy on defense. And was destroyed. So the point was, this was purely a myth. The Soviet Union was nearing the end well before this arms buildup ever came about. Yet, in 1989, when the Cold War ended, you still hear people today all the time will say this buildup in America, in the United States in 1980, led to the defeat of the Soviet Union because they couldn't keep up. No. They were already in free fall by, by uh, late 1970s. They were just barely holding on. Their army was made up of these two-year draftees, and alcoholism was so bad in the Soviet army that there's stories of men who would, um, the cleaner they would use for the radar sites outside of Moscow had alcohol in it, and they would smear it on bread, put it out in the sun, and then the alcohol would leach into the bread and then scrape off the toxic top and eat the bread and hope not to die. And then, to clean off their uh, radar, they used gasoline. Petrol. Huh? Is that <laughs> By the way, anybody know what gasoline does to uh, electronic components? It corrodes it and destroys it. Their tanks were so bad, and this was the kit in front of Remember that T-72? Please be the right photo. They had, here is a T-80 version. By the way, it's called reactive armor. They put armor outside of it, of the regular armor. So if someone shoots a, a shell at it, it'll explode on the armor on the front and not go through the second armor. But they had this automatic loader. Here is it, this is the diagram of it. And so it had one less man in the crew. So the thought was to have a smaller tank, more mobile. Normally tanks have four man crews. Commander, gunner, who aims it, loader, and driver. Make sense? You take out the loader, smaller tank, harder to hit. The problem is this, I think you can see it. You see it? The gunner sat right here in the middle of this. And sometimes the arm that would reach down would grab various parts of the gunner. <laughs> Now, what happens, watch this. Shell goes in, slam shut. You see it, slam shut? Shut. And the thing about it is, you can try to fire an arm, it doesn't go very far. And I don't, and let's put it this way too, sometimes it'd be the head. Sure, <laughs> or if they had play. Oh. And, horse, and the horsemen of Central Asia would play a game kind of like polo with you the head of their enemies. I'm not saying. I know, I'm thinking that'd be awesome for the next assembly, but. <laughs> so, so you know what happened? For obvious reasons, they can't use that, can they? It's bad for crew morale. Oh, they should have. Men are strapped in the tanks. Because there's all those moving parts, if they move around inside a tank when it moves, they're just hammered, just cut up. And so you, it, it pulls around, with nothing you do. That's how you have bad dreams about it. I hope you do. But, so, the gunner or the commander had to load it by hand. So they fired about one third as fast as American, British, German. The best tanks in the world are German. But the second best tanks in the world are British now. And then They're all really close, and hopefully they'll never fight the Germans or the British. But it was a paper type. 
You get the point there? Do you like the arm story? And well, I found that diagram, and I'm so glad I saved that. Because you can really see, you can imagine it, grab an arm. The French have got a better system with their Leclerc tanks, and they have the barrel come back to where the bullet, the shells are, and it just pushes the shell in. So it doesn't have this arm coming down. <laughs> We're working on a tank that would do that now. It's really expensive. And a loader is just better. Israel made a, a very good tank right now. And they they said, no, we don't want that. All right, let's prepare to work. Sound good? Who's your enemy? Canada. My enemy? Oh, at the school? Yeah. I think it's probably everyone. Even us? I'm not paranoid, but everyone, well, not you. I mean, you're good. But everyone out there, they're all getting. The system is rigged against you. It's so obvious. It's society. I mean, there are people right now spying at us from home. Can we talk about taking bodies? you what? Can we borrow his dead body? He has a dead body? Yeah. Please say he's referring to his ass. Well, no, I said his back. Yeah, that's. It's involved. Her soulmate. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her soulmate. 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 Her soul